What bilinguals tell us about culture, cognition, and the language. Throughout history, there have been many hypotheses about the way bilinguals handle information. One hypothesis is that all the information is stored centrally, that is to say, in one tank, and that the speaker has access to it equally with both languages which are represented by the various tabs. Another hypothesis is that the speaker's information is stored in linguistically associated ways or in separate tanks. However, according to Michel Paradis, the actual situation of a bilingual person combines parts of both hypotheses. Paradis' bilingual integrated model affirms that both languages are differentially connected to the same conceptual experimental information store. According to this three-store hypothesis, conceptual mental representations are independent of language, and to the extent that the lexical semantic constraints of item in each language differ from those in the translation equivalents. In other words, Language subsystems are connected to some unshared conceptual features. Did you know that in the last 25 years, cognitive scientists have come to see that using more than one language is a natural circumstance of human experience, not an exceptional condition that produces disordered speaking or thinking, According to a research conducted by Thang et al. in the United States with Chinese English bilinguals immersed in the American culture and in English as the language of the environment, bilingual speakers are sensitive to cultural cues in the environment that signal the presence of the native language. However, for some bilingual speakers, depending on the age of L2 acquisition, the cultural cues do not sometimes appear to suffice or to restrict language processing. On the one hand, for infants during early stages of a language development, which occurs at the age of two or three more or less, the face is the primary source of information about the connection between language and the social environment. For infants exposed to two languages from birth, Faces may be a special cue to which language is being spoken. Besides, according to a remarkable study, Cray bilinguals can discriminate which of two languages is being spoken because of the rhythm and melody perfectly well. Well, the reason is because these infants have developed both language systems simultaneously. It is important to highlight that it happens because at birth and during early childhood, both hemispheres have the same potential in their ability to mediate language. So, as the child grows and is posed to a language, such a linguistic process becomes gradually lateralized to the left hemisphere, where two fundamental regions associated with the linguistic process of production, as well as the comprehension of speech, are located. They are the Broca's area and the Wernicke's area. So, this process that is specialized to the left side of the brain is called lateralization. The period during which lateralization develops is considered as being a period of relative neural or brain plasticity optimal for language growth. Therefore, the process of lateralization is rapid between the ages of 2 or 3 to 5 and then proceeds more slowly until puberty, by which time it is completed. As a result of this, the acquisition of a second language after this period, that is to say after puberty, requires a greater effort. On the other hand, Considering the results of Sang's investigation, adults bilinguals are not always sensitive to cues in the environment that signals that only one of the two languages is relevant. This occurs because 
Although monolinguals and bilinguals' brain are exactly the same, during the language processing bilinguals, the brain regions specific to the L2 are located in the parietal and temporal posterior regions, which are controlled by the frontal area. However, what bilinguals and monolinguals have different is the activation of circuits in the brain that depending on the age of acquisition, those circuits are activated or not. That is to say, that if people acquire the language late, there will be circuits that won't be activated or used. For example, the circuits connected to the procedural memory or basal ganglia, such as syntax. Why? Well, it happens because when people learn an L2 late, they do that consciously and with practice. So they tend to depend more on the declarative memory. Definitely, there is no doubt that the age of acquisition influences the neural organization. On the one hand, the earlier a child learns an L2, the greater the overlap is, that is to say, simultaneous activation of both languages, in neural activity during grammatical tasks in both languages. On the other hand, the later bilinguals acquire a language, the more separate system in the broadcast area they have, due to the fact that people already have a linguistic system developed. So when making use of the L2, they rely more on their L1, in comparison to infants whose linguistic system belonging to the L1 and L2 developed at the same time, depend on one another. In conclusion, as a result of the early exposure to the L2, Native language cues and culture are more powerful determinants of language performance in early bilinguals rather than in the late bilinguals, whose speech evidences a linguistic and cultural dissociation in the RL2. To demonstrate this phenomenon, we have interviewed an English person who is an early Spanish bilingual and a native Spanish speaker. ¿Qué tan lejos está tu casa de tu trabajo? Ok, así trabajo en el centro de Manchester. Así tengo que subir el tranvía para llegar y tarda como 30 minutos más o menos. Mi casa está a um, 10 cuadras aproximadamente de la facultad. Con respecto a la imagen, si presencias ese evento, ¿Cómo lo describirías? Ok, lo que ha pasado en esta situación es que la mujer está hablando por teléfono y se tiró, y se tiró el jarón sin saber. Si presenciara este evento diría, uy, se le cayó el jarrón sin querer. As a result of the interviews, we could notice that as Fulga states in her article language and the perception of space, motion and time, considering the first question, English people who are early bilinguals tend to describe distance by means of the time it takes them to get to the location, whereas native Spanish speakers use kilometers and blocks as units of reference. In the case of the second task, in which they were asked to describe the event depicted in the image, the English speaker included the agent of the action in her sentence, making the person completely responsible for having broken the vase. On the other hand, in the case of the native Spanish speaker, the agent of the action is omitted. It is left aside of any responsibility, as if the action occurred unintentionally. Therefore, we reach the conclusion that although languages share the same basic views on motion, space, and time, bilingual speakers manifest a cross-linguistic variety that is affected by cultural cues. Now, taking into account the pedagogical implications, we consider it fundamental to resort to the concept of embodied or grounded cognition to teach English from experiential learning. That is to say, 
it is important to provide students with implicit instruction. But we think that the learning process gets more meaningful and motivating if pupils learn by experience and exposure. In other words, if they learn from being in contact with theory, language, etc. In this way, the internalization of knowledge occurs successfully. Just to mention one example, when teaching the motion verbs, instead of doing it only by writing a long and boring list of verbs on the board, or by solving hundreds of dull exercises in the textbook, learners could perform and compare English actions that differ from the ones we use in Spanish as an engaging and funny way of learning. Besides, in this way, learners become aware of the fact that languages are different from each other and when having to remember diverse vocabulary items, they will first recall the experience, that is to say, how they felt at that moment, and then they will come up with the given vocabulary items. An interesting example can be that in English, students could analyze as well as perform different English verbs of movement that in Spanish we don't have, since if we want to say plot, in Spanish, we say walk slowly, or for example, if we want to say trapes, in Spanish, speakers say walk slowly or aimlessly. If we want to say tiptoe, Spanish speakers have to say walk on tiptoe, let's say caminar en puntas de pie, or if we want to say trudge, in Spanish, we say walk wearily, clearly. These samples indicate that in Spanish, speakers need to add something else to the verb, such as a preposition or an adverb, that shows the way in which the action is carried out or performed. While in English, it is not necessary to add anything, since each mentioned verb, such as plot, traps, or tiptoe, carries the meaning by itself. Finally, as another suggestion, and considering everything mentioned above, it is evident that language and culture are linked. Culture influences the way we perceive the world, and therefore the way we express ourselves. The world is the same for everyone, but depending on our culture, we place our attention on different things. Even if we are proficient in a language, we can still fail at the pragmatic level. If we apply the rules of our L1 to our L2, we may sound rude, awkward or incoherent. We tend to transfer our knowledge of our L1 to our L2 because we are not aware of these things. Therefore, we believe that teachers should not limit their teaching to grammar or vocabulary, but also take into consideration the culture and how it influences the way we speak. Having always in mind that when teaching a language, we are also teaching different ways of seeing the world. This doesn't mean that we have to forget about our culture, but to be aware of the diversity. To illustrate the point mentioned above, we propose the following activity. English idioms, what are they? Idioms are expressions that have an established usage and their meaning may not be deduced from their literal words. Idioms make us sound more native and then are used in everyday language. 1. Read the following English idioms and explain their meaning. 2. Do you have similar expressions in your native language? How would you translate them? Well, and in order to conclude, we hope that everything we have said until now can help you reconsider your concept of bilingualism. The use of two or more languages is a natural phenomenon in which language, culture and cognition interact openly within the same mind and brain. It is evident that bilingualism takes different forms in different cultures and contexts. Having that in mind, a better understanding of bilingualism 
but provide insight of the optimal conditions for language learning. Taking culture and context into consideration is not only an innovative way of teaching, but also it is an enriching experience for the learner. They need to see language acquisition as an empowering experience, rather than a compulsory subject, and that they can benefit from it. They are not only learning a new language, but at the same time, they are acquiring a powerful tool to communicate their ideas in new and innovative ways.